when I'm consulting with somebody or, or coaching, I'm asking them, tell me about your business. Tell me, how do you get in the business? Tell me about it. How are you growing your business? I can very easily see what are the material items within that business that are going to either really have a, a strong a contribution to efficiencies or revenues or customer experience. I identify those things and that's what I focus on first. I get the big movers first and then from there I can feather in some of the more ancillary things that are going to just really fine tune the process. And we're live, Peter Taunton, Miami, Florida. Here we are. Here we are, right here in the pad, making it happen. And it is good energy here. It's yeah. 360 degrees of good energy. And Isn't it? You know what? And planting the, the palm trees, I was just telling you that I planted them just a few days ago. And I did it just for that reason, to, to give it a little bit more of a, of a earthy, you know, not that I'm a full-on tree hugger, but I just love my earth and, and palms and, and greens and flowers. I'm into it. One thing that I, I just said it right before, but it always resonated with me is your, we were at your Minnesota house and you were taking the extension cord and running it through some bushes or whatnot. And I, I went over the bush and you're like, no, no, no. And you get down there and you, you spend like 15 minutes making it perfect. And you're like, I like to keep everything tight. <laughs> and that's literally, I've noticed with everything you do, it's yeah. clean, it's decluttered. Yeah, it's probably my OCD more than anything. But to be honest with you, I, you know, I learned that you know, if I, if I, if I'm sloppy one, one place, I, I can be sloppy anywhere. So I just try to keep discipline and accountability in everything that I do now, like, let's face it, we all have our moments, but, um, and I'm not neurotic about it, but I like to keep it real. And for me, real is tight and on point. A lot that I've noticed in something that I've always just envied about you. So this is a unique podcast, first of all, because when we first met, I met you through the damn good day show. Somebody yeah. introduced me, Peter Taunton. I was like, sweet. We did the podcast. Six months later, I moved to Miami. We grab a drink. And then from then, it's just been, I mean, yeah. your friendship has been so amazing for me for yeah. all aspects of my life in terms of growth, in terms of friendship. And it's just been a lot. And I've noticed the people around you, you have this really good way of meeting great people and then yeah. keeping great people around you. Yeah, and I think... Um Thank you, by the way. And I think that that's important. I mean, I've, a lot of times that's, that's overlooked. And I think um, a, a lot of times in my consulting and coaching that I do when I'm talking to people th th that are struggling, one of the first questions I ask them is, tell me about your friends. And that's a really loaded question. And I say, well, and because and, and, some people say, oh, well, my friends are great. And I say, well, think about who the, who, the, who are the five people that text you the most and what is their energy like? Because if you're, if you're thinking, I'm thinking about doing this or I'm thinking about doing that, and they're always trying to throw a wet blanket on your dream or your idea, th that's, not, that's not a supportive friendship. That's not a healthy friendship because misery loves company in, in many cases. So I tell people, look, you know what? If you're going to make this pivot because you're not happy where you are in your life, sometimes that pivot involves changing your friends and leveling up in areas and not tolerating some other things. I mean, we all have some friends like that, that, that they can kind of suck the life out of us rather than pumping us up. And th that's what you need to be careful about. So for me, I, I try to surround myself with good people, with good energy. And every one of my friendships, I've got multi-level friendships um, depending on what I'm doing. And I appreciate that, right? And I really have a very small group that's in my real inner circle. And I got a fairly large group in my, in my, in my, my kind of my second ring. But all of those people are people that I respect and, and would hang out with any day. And, and you know, and I appreciate their, they're giving me their time and, 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 and listening to me and sharing ideas. That's what great friends do. I like it because you mentioned that you have your close friends and then you have like your second degree friends. I think that's so true in, in many aspects of my own life. Mm -hmm. you, every, every day you have a certain amount of time, right? And you wanna make sure you're spending it with good people. But those people that are getting those texts, those people that are coming to those little events, like you need to make sure that those people are moving your life along in many different ways, right? Yeah. And what's cool is that like the people that you do business with, the people that you work with, the people that you just have to fun with, you've, you've merged them all together. Yeah, I, and, and part of that is some of the things I'm involved with. Obviously, my music festival, who doesn't like music? music do you know what I mean? I mean, I, I invited you out to the festival, and I mean, that, that was a melting pot. 
right? There can, was some, can you tell people about that festival? Real of, quick? of course, it's the third week in July, and it's one of my one of my passions that I just love. I love I love music, and one of the things that I that I that I promised myself that I was going to focus on when I when I stepped down as the CEO three years ago was to just focus on things that bring me joy. And for me, music brings me joy and you know the talent and the passion of that not only the passion of the artists but the passion of the of the fan base is 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 pretty darn cool obviously the you know and some of my other things my lodge in africa another thing you know um with the, uh, my my stand against anti-poaching and things like that Th- those are all things that just bring bring me joy and that's what i want to focus on yeah and you you found these buckets right that you spend your time on right you have the lodge which is crazy. You can literally apparently have drafts just roll up on you while you're in an, an infinity pool. But I mean, some you're going to have to go there sometime, and I'd and I'd I'd, I'd love to 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 help orchestrate that. But you know, we we've got thirty thousand acres in this concession area, and my partner and I were we're we're very big on you know it's so natural. Um, for the animals. So even when the migration comes through, it's not uncommon for some of the animals that would normally migrate. Wildebeest is an example. We have resident wildebeest that just stay there because they're coming through and they go, you know what? I got a lot of food, water. I'm good. I'm going to park it here for a while. And they end up staying year round. So that's that's fairly unusual. But in, in our lodge, in our camp, it's a five-star camp. Uh, and uh, I say it's a camp, but it's it's hardwood floors and and uh, you know light light switches, generators, and everything. You you you'd really enjoy it. But we have lions and elephants drinking out of our pool. I love that cool. account. Nature is metal. Yeah. Just just seeing right. nature in its you know, rawest form. If you're ever looking for a good Netflix binge, you can look up like Our Planet. It's always such a good go to. Yeah. People that are fascinated by nature, I feel just live a more fulfilled life. Because it's everywhere around you brings you joy. Well, when you get to the Serengeti, make no mistake about it, you are a guest into their ecosystem. And you truly are. I, I mean, to the point where we'll roll up in our, in our vehicles, and they're, they're open-air vehicles, okay? Open sides, uh, open roof, and you'll roll up on lions, and they'll be seven feet from the vehicle. We'll have, we'll have male lions that are absolutely huge and so intimidating literally walk by the front of the vehicle and brush the tail up against one of our guides that's up there we've had cheetahs and leopards jump on the hood of our vehicle to get a higher vantage point as they're looking across the serengeti that's i mean it's such an unusual experience that you'll see but you're you're a guest never once will you feel threatened i've never had a lion i've been out there dozens of times i've never had a lion look at me, growl at me, it just doesn't happen. They don't even see you. It's the most unusual thing. Now, if you got out of the vehicle and ran, now, now, now you're going to, that's not going to end well for you, but stay in the vehicle. You're You're just fine. Do you have any sketchy experiences there that you can highlight? One of the most dangerous animals in, in, in all of Tanzania is the water Buffalo. I mean, it looks like a big black, um, black Angus cow with horns. Okay. With big horns. Okay. And they look just docile and, but they are so unpredictable. They, when they see you, they see a threat. Okay. So when we roll up on them on a vehicle, we, we, we never get closer than, you know, 50, 50 yards or so, because if, when you pull up on a herd of them, what happens is instinctively, all of the young get in the middle surrounded by the females and and then the younger males and then about anywhere from five to ten of the adult males the alpha males will step forward and they will start walking towards the vehicle they're not going to run for you one run at you they're going to walk but they're never going to stop okay they're going to come and they're going to distinguish or extinguish the 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 issue the threat so they'll they'll it's th- those are some of the most dangerous moments we've had some of our employees um that have been, had run in because one of them will wander up to our lodge and they'll get they'll get kicked or 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 you know pushed up against a tree or something they've had injury where it's them in the hospital we haven't had anyone die yet hit are hippos more dangerous than water buffalo hippos unpredictable especially when they have little ones i think they kill the most they do and you know you wouldn't you wouldn't think it 
you'd think they're kind of lumpy and dopey, but they're, they can get aggressive too. And they're sneaky. I mean, when you walk up to, I think in, for people in general, when they come across a body of water or like a nice pond or something like that, we, we like to walk up next to it. Okay. Well, that's, that's kind of a danger zone when you're in the Serengeti because water means life. And a lot of times those hippos, they'll be holding their breath under the water for, for minutes. Okay. And you'll walk up on it, not even knowing they're there. And then when, when they come up, they can, they, they can run really fast for a short period of time, whether it's them uh, crocodiles that doesn't matter you, you just have to be careful yeah we got the alligators in florida there's actually two crocodiles there's this really cool spot called shark valley it's a 15 mile bike loop it's about 30 minutes north of here yeah you go bring your bike you can just rip it and you see so many alligators and soft se- soft shelled turtles there's actually two crocodiles that are known to be in the parts but they're really rare my friend finally saw them after like 10 visits yeah. but those things are are they beasts. big oh yeah I mean, they're not like, I, I think he told me it was about like eight feet. Okay. Um, so I, crocodiles can get like. No, these, these, these crocs that are, that are sitting over in the Serengeti that are taking the wildebeest. So you see it on National Geographic. Yeah. The wildebeest, they sit on one side of the river waiting to, waiting to cross and they'll wait and they're apprehensive and they're stepping back and forth and they, they will sit there for hours. But something, at one point, one of them goes, and once they all go, it's just this dash, right? And those crocs are sitting there waiting, and it's just like fish in a barrel for them. But those crocs are huge. Something that fascinated me about last time we talked, you talked about your journey with Snap Fitness. We covered that from start to finish. Amazing. You were talking about how you went through many years of having one to three clubs, and you were going through the gauntlet of learning these lessons, and then eventually you got to the point where you're like, I'm going to franchise this, and you built... um, the empire, which was snap is snap fitness. I've seen in some of the most effective people that their ability to get to the juice quicker. Right. And what I mean is, is that when you first bring up a deal to someone and you first try to sell, let's say you're selling any sort of product or something, what have you learned that has made you much more effective to be able to condense timelines when it comes to getting a deal or making a deal move forward? I think one of my gifts, honestly, is um, I'm able to see when, I, when I'm consulting with somebody or, 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 or coaching, I'm asking them, what is the, tell me about your business. Tell me, how do you get in the business? Tell me about it. How are you growing your business? I can very easily see what are the material items within that business that are going to either really have a, a strong a contribution to efficiencies or revenues or customer experience. So I identify those things and that's what I focus on first. I get the big movers first and then from there I can, I can uh, feather in some of the more ancillary things that are going to just really fine tune the process. So then you basically break it down into movable parts and then go from there. Go from there. And then, you know, once you have the, the model itself, now you've, then you got to surround it with the, the people. you got to have good people, right? And, and I would say a lot, a lot of times when a business is failing, I say it's, it's, it's never the, the palace, it's the people. It's the truth. You know what? You, I've seen many businesses that fundamentally, it's a good, sound business, but they lack the human capital to really drive it to the promised land and where it needs to be. I see that all the time. And sometimes that starts at the top, which is hard. It's hard to tell the founder, hey, look, you know what? Here's some of the qualities that you're bringing to the table that some people are finding hard to follow. Um, your leadership style is a little bit condescending. So you've got to be a good steward of reading people and their personalities and how they want to be talked to. Some people can, some people can take the whip. Others can't. And you know what? You you can't have a you can't have a a, a room full of um, you know cowboys. Everybody plays a different role in in, in different things. So I always uh, appreciate it when I'm able to help people round out their staff and really have a diversified staff because those different roles are different people facing that that are going to lead to um, you know different contributions to the big picture of the company. That's interesting. I like that because there's so much toxic traits that some organizations can have. And I think a lot of times you have to go to those ground roots and ask those questions to get to the bottom of things. Are there specific qualities that when you see, if you were looking at 10 different business owners, specific qualities, whether that be integrity, honesty, whether the hustle, 
that trigger in your brain that these are the type of people that can take something to the promised lands? I can tell you what, I mean, I'm, I'm so thankful. My father just had his 92nd birthday the other day, the other um, week. And I learned so many life lessons from him. Here's one thing that I'm a firm believer in that, um, my father's leadership style was he would, he would be the first in the trenches. Okay. So that made a difference. My father owned a grocery store in the small town that we grew up in. And my father, you would see him at the checkout stand. You would see him shoveling the sidewalk. You'd see him stocking shelves. You'd see him in the office doing the books. Now, he had many great people on his team, but when somebody was, was uh, you know, getting throttled, because his store was very, very busy, and if somebody was having difficulty keeping up with keeping the, sh- the shelves stocked and looking really, really presentable, my father would jump in there. He would get in the weeds. He would jump in the trenches and help. And I think the loyalty that he got from his employees in doing that was, um, was exemplary. He was, I mean, people... He was, he, th- these people would do anything for him. And the other side, side of it, my dad was very compassionate and very kind heart, but um, he was not the one, don't mistake kindness for weakness. He was tough when he had to be tough, but more times than not, he found that using the feather and treating people with, with respect uh, and, and with high expectations, I think he made people around him better because I think he saw people, he saw more in people than they saw in themselves. And when you hear stories like that, it's, it's really empowering and it's really inspiring. And, and I had a chance to see that. And, and I've had so many opportunities to see that in, in the, my 30 years of business. So do you feel that he directly left that quality with you? Yeah, no question. I mean, I'm, to, to, I think you know, one of my first experiences in business of all time was, uh, was my, first day, my first day on the job, the very first club that I had an opportunity um, to, to, to have ownership in, I was living of all places in Orlando, Florida. And I got a call one day to come back and, and try to turn around the club that I grew up in the club that I played racquetball at every day. And, uh, when I went back to that club, my first day on the job, I'm walking around, I have this yellow legal pad and I'm walking around the club thinking of all the things that we had to do because the club was losing money. The club was losing $200,000 a year. So walking into that environment, I'm 22 years old. I'm rocking the mullet. I mean, it's not looking good. You would not look at me and think, this guy is going to turn this club around. Anyway, I've got this legal pad. I'm making notes of all the things we need to do. Well, one of the things that really stuck out was the club was filthy. It needed to deep clean. So I called a staff meeting for the, for the next morning. I said, I want all the staff to show up here. We're going to deep clean the club. And when I got there, the, there's probably 40, 40 to 50 people standing there. I, I knew about 15% of them. I'm the youngest one in the room, okay? And I said, hey, everyone, we're going to gonna, we're gonna clean. I'm going to divide you up. And this lady raises her hand, and she says, hey, Peter, before we get started, I have something I'd like to say. And I said, well, by all means, well, what's on your mind? And she goes, um, let's pause a little bit. We don't clean. And that was a defining moment for me. Now, think about it. I'm 22 years old. I've never managed people before, ever. So... I could have said, you know what, the woman's name was Barb. I could have said, you know what, Barb, you are exactly right. Who am I to bring all of you in here and expect you to clean when that's not what you were hired for? I could have done that, and that probably would have made sense in today's day and age, okay? But think about it. I mean, 30-some-odd years ago, anything flies, right? And I told her, hey, look, I said, hey, Barb, I appreciate that, and you also don't have a job, and I pointed to the door. Now, you could have heard a pin drop at that moment because people are thinking, Oh my, oh my gosh, who is this guy? Like the nerve on this guy. The nerve of this guy to tell her that you no, you no longer have a job and point to the door. But she ended up staying, thank God, right? She ended up staying, and I followed that message with to that group saying, hey, look, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but this business loses $200,000 a year. This business loses $200,000 a year. It's an absolute pigsty. And it's, it's like the staff here, it's like no one cares. So I talked about how do you want to show up. And it, it was sinking in. It was sinking in to my audience, not with everyone, but most of them. So then I divided everyone up and I said, look, I'll take the bathrooms. That was another defying moment. That was a great message to that entire room because I said, hey, look, it's not like I'm going to sit up here and dust tables. I'm going to take the worst job, the worst of the worst. And I learned that from my dad right? I'm going to lead by example. I'm going to take the, the, the crap job, right? And, and, uh, and you know, it worked out what the message it sent to everyone is, Hey, look, this guy, he doesn't play. 
he's he's here for real and uh, he's willing to jump in and get dirty. Practices so what he preaches. I gained I gained a lot of respect with everyone and and of that of that group I probably ended up letting probably 30% of them go just because they didn't have the people skills. They weren't they weren't coachable. They didn't want to be coached. You know, anyone can clean. We can teach anyone to do that, but they didn't want to lean they didn't want to lean into the people coming in. My expectation with everyone that comes in, we're going to call them by name, we're going to give them a clean club, we're going to give them a friendly environment. Those are things we can control, okay? And we're going to replace equipment as we go as we start generating a, a profit. Well, make a long story short, in, in, in a matter of about four years, I had the club turned where we were making money. In eight years, that club, I, had, I owned that club outright, and the club went from losing $200,000 a year to making $250,000 a year. So it can happen just that fast. And then I, I did that for the next 20 years. So at 22, when you go and you speak in front of these 50 people, and you're a 22-year-old, and you got these big dreams and big goals and everyone's looking at you like, who the F is this guy? Yeah. And you, and you have that moment where you're showing your leadership, you're in, unleashing your inner lion when the doors are closed, right? And you're no longer in front of 50 people. Do you ever doubt yourself? You're like, did I just do that right? Or what's going on? You- yeah. You know what? For real, that's a great question. I was, in all honesty, I was, I was petrified. Um, just because you're walking into an environment and you don't know the, 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 the feeling of the room. Most of them I'd, I'd never seen, never met. And, and they didn't really know what this change of the guard was. They didn't really understand why the old manager was gone. For them, everything was fine because this is how the club had been run forever, right? So they didn't know. The lens that they were looking through was clouded, okay? So... I, I felt I always believed in myself and I learned that through my days of, of playing professional racquetball that look you're in the you're in the court it's you in the court I mean there's no teammates unless I'm playing doubles with with my twin brother but you know it's you in the court so you're you're going to have some of those moments where you got to dig deep and um, and so you got to believe in yourself and I, I talk about that today too of you know when you get up in the morning when you're looking in the mirror you got to believe in that person staring back at you um, because if you're looking for somebody else to fill your cup, it's it's going to be a tough road. Some professional racquetball is something you never hear someone say. Yeah, right. How do you get into prof- the racquetball? <laughs> I was, you know what? I mean, it was it was a, it was a lifetime ago, but I was literally it was one of those sports, and I can't explain it. Uh, uh, Ian, it was one of those sports that when I picked up a racket, it felt good in my hand. It was just something that came nat- really natural to me, right? And to my twin brother too. And, um, we, we, we played that in a matter of a probably four years. I picked up when I was 13. By the time I was 17 or 18, I was a sponsored pro and, uh, with one, with the largest racket manufacturer in the world. And so I was a sponsored pro. So was my twin brother. And, you know, fast forwarded another five years after that, we were, we were two of the best players is in that, the country. Is it two on two? Yeah, for doubles, if you're playing doubles. So you and Paul were just tag we, we, we played teaming? singles and doubles, yeah. Oh, um, wow. Yeah. That, so, that must have been so competitive. It, it was so competitive. And, I mean, it was so competitive. And at that level, it's really, it was, you know, it really a, an experience. But we, it was a chance for us. We grew up in a small town. I mean, we grew up poor in a small town in, in Minnesota. I went to school in a two-room schoolhouse. So literally, I didn't see a lot. And that was a chance for me to kind of travel around the country and, and, and see parts of the country I'd never seen before. So I appreciate that time of my life. I, I remember badminton. I mean, my brother used to play so much badminton. That yeah. sport is so fun. Yeah. Underrated. No, yeah. Now, you know what's fun now? Do you, do you play any uh, paddle tennis? Paddle tennis? No. But Have you tried it yet? I know a guy that I met from Dubai, um, Sammy. He started a company called Short Point Shout Out. And he was all in on his company. And then he found paddle tennis. And yeah. at like 34, shifted his whole life to becoming like a professional paddle it's he so fun. Loves it. Yeah. Paddle tennis is, is an absolute gas uh, or, or pickleball, you know, up in the Midwest, they play a lot of pickleball, not a ton of paddle tennis down here. It's I'm hard pressed to find in Miami. I'm hard pressed to find a pickleball court. And, uh, but I did find paddle tennis. So you could probably put a pickleboard court right over here. I probably could, you know, it'd fit, it was it, but it, we'll have to play it sometime. That'd be fun. It, it, it's for real. It's fun. But you were talking about how you're looking to get into more hobbies, right? Yeah. And one of those hobbies that you're interested in is free diving and spearfishing, right? Yes. Yeah. Spearfishing is sweet. Yeah. Well, and I know. And I was so excited when I saw that you were doing it. I, I thought, you know what? 
I've got to, I've got to do that too. So I literally rented a guide to, to teach me how to do it. I bought, I bought all the gear as for my son's birthday. So I bought him all the, all the gear. I bought myself the gear as well, hired a guide to bring us out. But the day that we went out, it was cloudy and wavy. It was a total buzzkill, right? But I want to do it again. As I, as I mentioned, I was in Turks and Caicos last week and it was like swimming in an aquarium and there was these yellow tails swimming by. I mean, I, I could have hit them with a, you know, with any, with anything, reach out. You could almost reach out and touch them. It's, yeah. It was, it was, it was so much fun. So I want to get out and do it again when the, when the weather's perfect for it. Yeah. The, the you have to, cause yeah. spear, spear fishing is, is easily just one of the most exciting hobbies that's out there. We'll have to do it. You know what? We'll have to do it because we have the boat. So we'll just go out sometime. If, if you know where to go. So we go near Delray beach um, okay. So Josh, you remember Josh? So you, yeah, yeah. So you drive there. So then. Josh got like this really small, amazing little boat off of Craigslist. Yeah. And we've just been, I mean, this thing, you know, gets out, gets us from point A to point B and right. it's amazing. We go out to like 30 to 40 feet and yeah. just anchor up and then go, but we've been doing it all Thir- wrong. Wait a minute, 30 to 40 feet. Yeah. That's that deep. Oh shit. I'd never get to the bottom. I'd be shooting them from like 35 feet. <laughs> that's fine that gets you there oh. but people do it wrong like they just jump in and they start doing like that's what we were doing and i was doing it very dangerously because i've been scuba diving my whole life yeah and like with scuba for example you have to breathe out and exhale as you go up because you're ingesting air at a lower atmosphere because you're yeah. lower but with free diving you don't need to do that right so you can take a breath up the top you can go all the way down and you can come all the way up without ever like exhaling only at the like the top 10 feet where you ever need to exhale just to help you get that inhale. But it was fascinating. And I think you should potentially think about taking the course. It's this free diving course with Errol Putignoff. He's freaking awesome. Yeah. He can go 200 feet on one breath. My gosh. And he's teaching us and he was explaining how you need to become comfortable with CO2. So it's like when you're holding your breath and you start getting those contractions. Like, boom, 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 yeah. That's something that's very actually natural and it's your body accumulating CO2. And once you get comfortable with that, you can increase your breath hold. So I was telling you, like I couldn't hold my breath a minute and a half. And after doing some of those breathing exercises, I got two and a half minutes yeah. on a static breath hold. That is, that, honestly, I find that so interesting. I don't think I could hold my breath. I'd probably be hard pressed to hold it for a minute. But with these breathing exercises, you yeah. can. And the biggest thing I learned is that as a society, we breathe with our chest and not our stomach and our diaphragm. And also, I don't know if you ever heard of the book Breath by James Nestor. No. It's fascinating. Okay. It talks about how breathing through your nose has just life-changing effects on your anatomy and your body. Things like sleep apnea are a big cause of mouth breathing. And a great example is like, for example, if you breathe from your mouth, sometimes you're dehydrated the next morning because if you go like this, you know, you get moisture in your mat, like on your hand. Yeah. You can't yeah. do that through your nose. Yeah. So the no- he talks about how nose breathing helps fix your teeth, helps fix your entire passageways. And it's really the proper way to breathe. So what he taught me is that when you breathe through your diaphragm, you do like one breath through your diaphragm, hold it, and then exhale all through your stomach. Hold it. You redo that a few times called a breath up. We did that, and after three different breath holds, I got one and a half minutes, two minutes, and then two and a half minutes. Wow. Isn't that fascinating? That is fascinating. Man, <laughs> you're coachable, dude. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to get his, I'm gonna have to get his info and, and, and follow up with him. I think that's really interesting. And you know what? Whether you're free diving or not, just being able to hold your breath for two and a half minutes, that, that's like having a parachute. When you need that, you're going to want, wish you had it, right? Yeah. So that's a great tool that you have. So do you think if you went down, jumped in the pool right now, you could hold your breath for two and a half minutes underwater? First of all, do I, your would breath need, ups? I would need some pressure. Okay. I would need some people watching me. Yeah, you know? right, right. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, sure. I'll, I'll wimp out at yeah. one and a half. No. But uh, if I did it in a pool with doing the breath ups, on my third, I've proven I can do it then. But yeah. yeah. But I would like to get to like three, three and a half minutes. Wow. Because I, like, I, I think the thing is, is that if you can do two and a half minutes on a static breath hold, static breath is just putting your face in the water and just you breathe your diaphragm, then your chest and then hold. If you can do that for two and a half, it means you can be free diving for like a half of that because you're using energy. Yeah. But it's all about like the descent. You can kick your leg up and you just fall down like an anchor and then you can get down there and shoot those yellowtail and then wow. you're cooking them up right on this counter. Wow. 
It's such a it's fascinating a, hobby. That is really, I'm trying to visualize it. When you're going down like 20 feet, that which, which isn't what, the, what people would even consider a free dive, but for me, that is a, that's a free dive. I have a hard time getting getting down there. You know, honestly, when I was when I was um, doing my spear fishing, I don't think I ever got to 10 feet. I mean, by the time I got down there, I had to come up because I was gassed. Right. I'm like, man, I got to go down there. I got I to gotta be shooting on the way down and shooting on the, <laughs> shooting on the way up. And it's not even enjoyable because you're just dying the whole you're time. You're just dying. <laughs> you're just dying. And you shoot, you, know, you shoot your spear, and then I could barely have enough energy to pull the, to draw it back to reload it. You know, it was just bad. Right. So we should go on like a more micro scale, not yeah. full boat captain stuff. Yeah. And just figure that out. Because right what I do is Josh just hits me up. He says conditions are perfect. We get down to his boat around 6.37 and we just go. Yeah. But I'm just trying to get better Why at so it. early in the morning? Uh, mostly because it's just nice to be there that early. Okay. Uh, I don't really know the difference. Every time All I right. complain because I don't like driving 40 minutes to Lauderdale. Yeah, that'd be me. I'm like, hey, dude, no, let's do, let's let's back this up a little bit. Let's do it at 10 in the morning. If it's on a weekday, it makes sense because then yeah. you get all your stuff done by 10. Now, you know? do you guys do any chumming when you're... We do. Yeah. So right. we do two things. We have a chum near the boat, but then we also take sardines with us. And you take the sardines just in your hand and you go out. And then you can just like do that. Like there has been two bonita that have come by. They're so freaking fast underwater. And, I don't even uh, know what a bonita is. It's like uh, kind of like a tuna, but it doesn't taste as good. Okay. It's a great bait fish. All right. They're fast though. They look like, you know, blackfin tuna. They're, yeah. Actually, I think a blackfin tuna is another name for a bonita. I have to double check that. Yeah. We, sh we caught some blackfin tuna when we were, when we went out with the guide, when I took Max and TK and we went out there, we caught. Um, a lot of mahi mahi. We caught like six mahi mahi and probably ten blackfin tuna. How gorgeous are mahi mahi? Right? Seriously. Yeah, I could talk about this for the next hour. Yeah. But. No, they are. They're they're beautiful and they're so athletic. That's what I really appreciate about them. They're such an athletic fish. Right? Yeah. And those tuna too, man. They just feel like little little bullet. They're just little bundles of muscle and then it's such the reward i just think the hobby of being able to get your fish and, and cook it and eat yeah. it is just yeah a game changer i look forward to i look forward to doing that you know fishing and then um, filleting them on the boat and having fresh fish i think that's great that's the best yeah i i, I, I think it is too. we should do a sushi party yeah you know like yeah. in advance everyone brings their own fish right get some sushi rollers no man it'd be it'd be fun It'd be fun to go catch some of those blackfin and then come up and have them that night. So let's digress this conversation real quick. Yeah. I'm excited to hear a little bit about what you're doing with nautical bulls. Yeah. So I think it's fascinating. You've built and scaled Snap Fitness. You've seen it firsthand. You've run this l huge organization through the highs and the lows. You always talk about your top big mistakes you make on, on your, on your um, Instagram page with all your different interviews you do. But now you've taken that whole, you're taking your talent Instead of the Miami Heat, you chose nautical bulls. Right. Talk to us through that decision-making <laughs> process. You and, know what? Uh, Number one, I feel so fortunate because stepping stepping down from from Lift Brands opened so many doors for me, which I am which I'm thankful for. Because you know, you know, people always say one door closes, another one opens. Yeah, but for me, it that, that's kind of how it worked. And ironically, back at my lake home, there was a couple that lived just a few miles up the road from me. And they called me one day and asked if I would, if I would uh, come sit down with them. That's how I met the founders of Nautical Bowls. And uh, in sitting down with them, I said, if it were me, I would create this into a franchise concept. And they said, we don't have any franchise experience. And I said, well, I, I do. I've been doing this for 20 years. Long story short, I be, I'm equal partners with the founders. And I made some changes to the, to the restaurant being we used to have our backs and, and we were preparing the bowls, but we took a page out of Subway and Chipotle, two great brands. So we're making your bowl right in front of you. And many of the acai bowl places you'll go to, it might take 10, 15 minutes for you to get your bowl. We're making your bowl in two minutes or less. Here's what I love about it. The, the product, if I'm going to have an acai bowl, I want it plant-based. I want it gluten-free. I want it dairy-free. I want no refined sugar. Uh, and and or organic, so that, that's us. You know, th those are those are the big qualities that people are looking for. That plant-based, dairy-free, gluten-free. Those are the big three. Organic doesn't hurt. No refined sugar. So that's our bowl, and it's a bowl of goodness. It's a bowl of superfoods. So once I knew I had the right product, 
then dumbing it down so I, so I could teach anyone how to do it, and we've done that. We our our restaurants we have no cooktops, no exhaust hoods, um, no no grease traps. It's really your food prep is only slicing bananas and strawberries. Everything else comes ready ready to roll. Fundamentally, rolling it out. Uh, I'm I'm surprised. I mean, it it doesn't surprise me. I'm pleasantly surprised, but it doesn't surprise me because the product is so good. The business is so affordable to get into. In eight months, we've taken an idea and grown it to today we've awarded over 50 locations. I've got seven open. Um, I have 14 under construction as we speak and another 12 that are in the um, lease negotiating process. Uh, I've, just for me, in Miami, I've got LOIs out for, on six locations here in Miami. So I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be in the acai business. So I, I took the job as a CEO. I love it. It's a great concept. The stores are absolutely killing it. And, and we're, it's okay to be different. All we sell is acai bowls. So if you're looking for a smoothie, if you're looking for avocado toast, we're not your jam. We do, we do acai bowls and we do it better than anyone else. Acai bowls are one of the earth's greatest gifts. Uh, right? They're so good. And it's here to stay. And what people need to understand, our bowls, they look so fantastic. They go, no, no, I don't, I don't, I'll have dessert afterwards. And I go, no, this, hey, look, make no mistake about it. This is not dessert. We don't compete with Ben and Jerry's. This is, this is a meal replacement. And what I love about it, the product is so relevant. You know what I mean? I have people that have it in the morning. Um, for breakfast, people have it mid morning after their workout. Some people have it for lunch, mid afternoon snack to tie them. Over. And you can freeze them, right? Man, I'm the king of it. I mean, at my lake home, and once I get some open here in Miami, I'll have them all the time. But at my lake home, I always have at least ten of them in my freezer, and I just pull them out. You can either let them thaw naturally, naturally for a little bit, but I'm impatient. I nuke them for about forty five seconds, and then and then hit them. I love it. Peanut, peanut butter with acai bowls is a game changer. It's money. Right? It's one of the greatest things ever. I'm with you. No, they're, they're t they taste fantastic. We have 10 signature bowls. They're all uniquely different in color, flavor, and texture. But it's a great product. It's a big, great business concept. And, you know, my goal with this is, you know, I want, I, want to, I want to build another monster, right? I'd love to build another, you know, uh, I'd love to, to build another thousand, you know, uh, unit company. So... I've done it three other times, so this will be the fourth. What are the biggest things that take this beautiful passion you got and allow that could fall through the cracks that would, as you expand, like what do you need to make sure that you continue to instill that the brand stays of high quality, that no one's cutting corners? What are some of those lessons you've learned there? You have to, if the, uh, those things that you're talking about, cutting corners, you can't give your franchisees any corners to cut. That's, that's what's key. You can't, you can't give them the opportunity to. You have to control the process. And that's why you buy a franchise. You buy a franchise because you trust that the people that have created the franchise have figured it out. And, and for me, my goal, I'm going to teach you how to make acai bowls. I can get anyone to do that. But the other side of it is I'm going to teach you how to create a community and a culture within your four walls to get people want to come back. So now think about it. You've got a great product and you've got a great energy. All right. Those are those are the th two things. When you have those two things together, magical. That's when magic happens right there. Right. And, and then from there, it's a matter of, of teaching people how to expand their business. All right. One worked. And, and some people I would say, you know what, don't play small ball. All right. If you want to be think big, be big, think small, be small. So I help people say, look, this is a business. You're spending off cash. Let's leverage this to open another one. I mean, someday you have three, four of these stores. Suddenly you're making a half a million dollars a year. You're you're 85 percent of our franchisees are semi absentee owners, meaning they're not back there making bowls. They're just managing the business from an arm's length. They're spending their time on mentoring their staff and creating that community and culture within the community and within their four walls. What kind of gives you that high? Uh, you, you, a lot of times when you see someone that's gone through a journey like you, which is not a lot of times, yeah. uh, not many people have exited a successful company and then still have that hunger and drive to go do it again. What gives you that joy in the process for someone that, quite frankly, might be looked at as has everything, right? But yet yeah. still shows up to work and grinds like it's day one. Yeah, I don't think, you know, I... Just, I'm just speaking for me that 
um, it's not about the money, right? And and I've been I've been blessed, you know. I've had two two very large events in my life, and and um, money doesn't make the man, right? And retirement is so overrated. The things that I enjoy, I enjoy golf, I enjoy fishing, I enjoy um, uh, spear fishing, all the things that I enjoy to do. If I was not working and I did those things every day, pretty soon they wouldn't be special anymore. So I've got to get up and have purpose. I've got to get up and feel like I'm contributing, uh, not only feeding my soul, but, but, but paying it forward. I honestly, nothing for me, and this sounds so cliche, but I, I really love it when I can help people win. That really fills my cup, that helping people find their way to the promised land of financial freedom, whatever that looks like through their lens and, uh, and helping them get there, changing lives, and then teaching people how to give back. That, you know, the, the Bible says, for those where a lot is given, a lot is expected, right? And so it can't always be the me show. You've got to show up a lot of different ways um, in this life, and, and giving back is one of them. Yeah, it seems integrity is, is absolutely crucial too. Yeah. It goes back to, again, the relationships you've built and the people in your life. It's something that I'm just, I'm always grateful and, and admiring from the distance. Yeah. Um, people like Michael, Kenny, yeah. all the people that you've introduced me to, I'm talking studs, yeah. stars, all you stars. Know? All stars. Right, they show up. You know what? They're, they're, they're passionate people. They're passionate in life. They're passionate in their work with their families. That's great. They're compassionate, which is another great quality. They root for the underdog. Um, they'll, they'll fight for the underdog, which is such a noble quality that I don't think you see enough of. People talk about it, but when shit hits the fan, you know, they're the last in. And that, that's, you know, I think showing up, you got to show up on all fronts, right? And so these, you know, I, I'm wired that way, and I try to instill that in others. And I tell you what, when you live a life like that, you'll live a full life. Looking at your, the, your life and the many different experiences you've had from, you know, heartbreak to huge highs, huge lows, how do you see life today at your age and, and just looking back at your, your past, how do you, how has that dictated your priorities today in terms of the way you operate? Well, you know what, I, I mean, honestly, the uh, losing my son, uh, um, you know, almost a, a year ago, last April, is unexpected, right? And it's something that you'd never want anyone to go through. So that is the, that's that's the bottom ring of completely gutted. Um, so, but you learn from everything. And when you go through something like that, you're going to go down one of two paths. You're either going to bury your head in the pillow and never never leave your house, which is for many people a very viable option. Okay, because they're that devastated. Um, or you're going to, you know, wake up, spit in your palms and say, look, I, life has got to go on. So, so I know for us and I know with my family and, and his friends that it's not that we don't have those tough moments, but you, you have to press forward. And, and, and Bo would want that. So that's that side of it. The other side of it is, um, you know, work or relationships. Hey, look, that is, that is life. And, um, none of us are getting out of here alive, so you have to embrace those moments of of bliss and those moments of, oh my gosh, what am I doing? Those moments that are so unpredictable and, and, and scary, and you've got to embrace those moments as well. The other side of it is being comfortable with failure. I mean, we all fail constantly, right? And if you have this fear of failure, you live such a guarded, sheltered life and I would say some of the best, some of the, some of the greatest learning experience I've ever had have been through times of failure, through times of adversity, where I've had to dig deep, really think about what's a calculated way to work my way through this and come out the other side, you know, with as less, with, with as least road rash as possible. Very important. Yeah. I mean, I'm glad you brought that up because I remember when you first told me, I was so caught off guard because you, you almost just were, you did a great job of, of putting on a face, right? While you were mm. working through some really hard shit. Yeah. And it's for someone that has been able to go through that type of heartbreak and tragedy. 
and still just come up on top and still take those philosophies that you've instilled upon yourself and building a business. It's really admirable. Yeah. It's, you know what? I, I appreciate that. And there, there, you have those moments where it's, you know, I've, I've had those moments where, you know, you're, you're, you're crying like a two year old child. Right. I mean, and, and they come at the, at the, at, at moments when you least expect it, you know, and, you know, you see something that reminds, I was just snowmobiling with my oldest son in Jackson Hole just a few weeks ago. And in those moments, I always say, I, I wish that he were, that he were, you know, here with us too. Cause I know he would have appreciated and loved it, but that's just now. So now, you know, he's, he's, he's with us uh, just through, through another dimension is all. Yeah. I love seeing Sonny's posts all about it. Yeah. Yeah, you know. it's so, you know, he's very, he's still very present in our lives. You know, we, we, we know that he's in a better place and we, we have to hold on to that. And we know that we'll all be together again someday. It's interesting. This, the journey of life, as we try to figure out how to live lives and these principles we live by, but really we're just a bunch of, you know, giant Neanderthals walking around the planet, trying to figure stuff out, driven by these emotions and these hormones and yeah. trying to find happiness, but like trying not to suffer, but the, the ultimate joy is in suffering because if you don't suffer you never experience joy and if, if everything's given to you you don't appreciate it you know yeah. it's a crazy life and spin you and know? i tell you what and and the more that you experience and you know when you have some of those unbelievable lows it gives you a unique perspective on on everything it gives you a unique perspective on how great life is how great living is and then how, you know, how bad it can get, but to, to realize that you will come through the other side, that you can get through it. You will get through it if you set your mind to it. And, and, uh, it's not that you're not going to have some tough moments ahead and, 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 uh, and, you know, have some sad moments, but you, you will, you'll get through it. Hobbies, I think are huge. I think that the number one thing that most people are lacking in their life is just hobbies they love and care about. Right. Right. You mentioned spear fishing or the Serengeti or, you know, yeah. doing all sorts of crazy stuff or playing, you know, racquetball, right? Yeah. People need more hobbies. Yeah. If people had more hobbies, they'd be so much happier, you know? It, and you, you know what? You have to force yourself to do some things. Especially the older we get, the less the, the less apt we are to just try new things. And I don't know why. I don't know. I don't know why we're like that. And I'm speaking for myself. I always talk about, oh, that looks like fun. I've just never been one of those guys that says, oh, it looks like fun. Okay, I'm going to do it. I just don't do it. I've got to kind of convince myself, and then I've got to carve out the time, because I try to get. I'm I'm busy, and I like to be busy. All right. And sometime when I feel like I'm I'm off centered, meaning I'm working too much, and there's not enough time with my family times with my dearest dearest friends and then time for me and time for work i mean that's kind of my circle right um and and sometimes work takes up too big of a chunk for that and you know people they measure why are you why are you still work? why aren't you retired why you know you you've you've got all these things and you've been so successful but like we spoke earlier that's not it that's not the answer but what you got to be careful of is what I really have to be careful about is, is not going back to my old ways, which is just working. Because when I was in my, you know, 20s, 30s, 40s, I was a working fool, right? I was getting it done, you know, and, uh, you know, I've got a lot to show for it. So you but felt like you had to sacrifice other aspects of your life? 100%. I mean, I sacrificed a lot. I feel I have extreme guilt. Even, even to this day with my kids, I have extreme guilt because... You know, I didn't, uh, there was many things that I, that I would have wanted to do, but I, I grew up in a family where my dad, I saw my dad get up every day and go to work at seven in the morning, come home seven or eight o'clock at night. He did that every day except Sunday, no joke. And he's, his role was he provided and he protected our family. Okay. And, and I observed that I had a front row seat to that life and so for me, not working and not providing and not protecting, I felt like that was my first priority. I was old school that way. Today, things are a little bit different, but um, in, in the way, you know, the, the family life is, is lived. But back then, I did. So I have extreme guilt that I miss so many of those moments that you don't get back, those fleeting moments of, you know, your, your children growing up. My kids today are great, and they say, Dad, you were 
you know, they're, that I, they they say I was a great dad and would and you probably and say you're just being hard on yourself and and that's what we tend to do. We that's what we tend to do. But you know, I have I have um, you know um, I wish I that you could have some do overs, but you don't get do overs. It just is what it is, and you just have to press forward. I mean, those are the happiest people. Yeah, you know, you have to, you have to, you know what? You can say you're sorry, and man, I wish I'd have done that better, and and that has got to be enough. You know what I mean? You got to be able to say you're sorry. And then you have to say, let's try, try to do better. I'm yeah. going to try to do better moving forward. Yeah. That's all you can do. Well, the world's very forgiving. Yeah. You know, every, mean, every day there's a new tragedy and no yeah. one cares the next week. I was, you know what? I was, I was uh, coaching a, a woman the other day and she's been, she hasn't spoken to her mother for seven years. And I listened to her and I listened to her, her, her anger and her frustration and her, her grand, her mother is in her, in her upper seventies now. And, and I told her, look, you're going to regret, you know, you don't, you never know when your when your time is up. And I promise you, if your mother were to die tomorrow, you're going to have huge regret for not taking the high road. I said, look at you, you're 50. You've got a, a beautiful life. You're mad at your mother for things. She was doing the best she could with what she had. And you're harboring this anger and frustration on something that doesn't even matter. And it's affecting the, the two of you. I promise you, she's not thinking about it the way you are. And she grew up in an era where you, that she's just accepted this. She's accepted this, that, you're, that, you're, that you've ostracized her. You haven't talked to her for seven years. And so I said, you need, you need to call her. You need to call her and say, and, and just take the high road. Tell her, hey, look, I'm sorry, but I want you in my life. And I want, I want to, I want us to be together and I want us to spend the rest of our lives together in a better place. And I'll be damned if she didn't do it. And coincidentally, she called me here about three days ago and she said, best thing I ever did, life changing. She's got, it's fit. She felt like she had the weight of the world off her shoulders. So it's just kind of funny how we, how we harbor some of these things and how those things can manu manifest themselves into so many other parts of our life. The, so the hate we have for others just, destroys us not the other person Hate, the, the, the bitterness the um the envy all, all of it you know it's just so the greed it's those are all just such bad qualities that you've got to be really you've got to be really self-checking in those areas to make sure that you're not that you're not leaning too far one way or the other oh it's deep stuff but it's interesting too because your aspect of when you you're you go to church and you're very religious. You found a really cool church with Vu Church, yeah. which is really interesting. Yeah, yeah. But I mean the best, and and I'm not. A, you know what? I'm not a. I wish I could be one of these guys that can that, that can quote scripture. That's not me. You know what? I I barely know the Bible. I I mean I know it just enough to be dangerous, but it works for me. It centers me. So for me, you know, I I wonder how did the kid that grew up youngest of seven in a two room schoolhouse, um, quit college, ADD. How does that person go on, uh, go to build one of the largest wellness brands in the world? Jets, yachts, multiple homes. How do you get there? So for me, if I can't take a step back and look up in the heavens and say, Hey God, what, what is your plan? You, you must have a plan for me. So I'm yours. Just try to point me in the right direction. So I, I, I get up every day, honestly, with that kind of a mindset saying, look, I don't want to be a burden in anyone's life. I want to bring sunshine into anyone I meet. I want to have compassion for others. And, and I, I ask God, put me in harm's way. Put me in the places where you think I can do the most and the best for you. And it's, it's, it's worked out. I put it in his hands. So I, that's one burden I'm not, I don't have to worry about. I put it in his hands and just direct me where you want me to be, and I'll be your soldier. When you pursue something, are you a visual person? Do you imagine it in your head? Do you? Yeah, I do just because I think we, we, we all do. When I was younger and poor, I, I honestly, I envisioned myself driving a Corvette, okay? Um, that was a big deal for me. And your goals change. And look, it's, you know, could I, should I be embarrassed about, you know, all these material things that I always wanted in my life? Look, I could say that I didn't think it, but it'd be a bold faced lie. I mean, 
I thought about it all the time. For me, success was a lot of it up until probably my late, but my mid forties, honestly, embarrassingly enough, I, I equated success with money. And I think a lot of people do. I was constantly chasing it. Right. And it was fleeting and nothing. And, and I was so driven. Nothing was enough. Okay. I was always when, you know, even in my book, impossible hill, when I, when I would climb one hill, I would, I'd be looking for the next hill to climb. Right. And that, that persistence will serve you well. But in my book, I try to instill, it's okay to climb, but just be centered and have balance. And, and that's what I didn't do. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm hardest on myself, but I had a front row seat to living the American dream. I just wish I had lived it a little differently, if that makes sense. That's interesting. It's cool that you can just be honest about that. Completely. And I think that's what, what people can appreciate. And when I coach, when I'm, when I'm coaching other CEOs and company and, and, and founders, they're the ones I find most interesting because in my honesty and in my stories, they see themselves, those real raw moments that it's hard to admit to, those thoughts that you have and um, the, the experiences that you've gone through in your life because they may be a little different tone, maybe a little different lens, but fundamentally the same experience and you feel the same way on the other side. You may feel some guilt. You may be harboring some you know, some, you know, some, you might have some very uncomfortable moments through that. You got to, you have to embrace them. You have to reflect on them. Um, if there's people you've offended on the way, you've got to, you know, apologize, but then you have to let it go. Okay. And that's the big part of it. You have to own it. If, if you've offended, you have to try to make amends and that's all you can do. Period. Then, then you pivot and you walk on because that past is behind you. That moment is gone. The, you can't change time. So you the ability to move on is one of the most important traits. And people can't. People have such difficulty doing it. And I tell you what, you can't truly pivot in your life until you get rid of your baggage. It's so true. And people say, oh, Peter, that's not baggage. It's totally baggage. It's total baggage for you. It's holding you back. It's something that, uh, that occupies a space in your mind that manifests itself into other things. And until you embrace it and, and let it go so you can find room, some headspace for other new adventures in your life and new feelings, it's never going to change for you. The baggage situation is so real. We all have it. We all come with baggage. We all do. And the older you get, the more you have. I mean, and it's so easy to blame it. It's so easy to blame it on like, oh, my mom was this or my family was this or this traits in us. And we always use that to lean on. And You wouldn't believe the amount of times. Where I was say, heartbroken by that that yeah. dude and when I was 14, never got over it. You yeah. Know? Or, yeah. Hey, you know, I tell people, hey, I'm sorry your mom bur burnt your birthday cake. Okay. I'm sorry about that. But I, I see people in their 40s that are still talking about how, you know, Johnny got a car and they didn't get a car when they turned 16. I'm like, are you shitting me now, bro? You're here. You are, you know, 20 some odd years later. And that's, that's a bee in your bonnet. And that's, you know, you got to let that go. You know, it's a you weird know? moment when you first look at your parents as people and not parents. Yeah. It's, you know what? It's a, it's a, it's really that, that those moments were as a parent, when you can, sit down and talk to your children and their young adults with opinions and they're self-sustaining, contributing to society. And yes, they're, they're your child, but they're your friend, they're your child. And, um, and you can have, you know, worldly conversations with them about it. And it's not, and it's not, and you got to make sure that you're not always parenting that you can, you can sit around and laugh with them and cry with them. And if they ask you for advice, give it to them. I mean, with my, with my kids, just speaking for me, I'm always going to be their father, but I don't always need to parent if that makes sense. And when they, they know that if they ever need anything from me or want some advice, I'll give them an ear and it'll be, it'll be, you know, open and, and I, I won't, I won't think any, any more or less of them, but, um, it's important that you can try to have that with your, with your children. But once again, the hardest thing that many people deal with, with children as they get older is they always think they have to parent. 
they're always saying, I mean, how many times have you heard a parent say, oh, you're going to wear that to, to a 25 or 30 year old person. It's an adult, right? And uh, yeah, they're going to wear it. They made that choice that they're going to wear it and they're comfortable with it. And if they're comfortable with it, that's all that matters, right? Right. You can walk around wearing your bonnet or your suit or whatever it is that you, however you want to roll. You're conservative if you want to, you, know, you roll how you want to roll, but you've got to give people the flexibility to be who they want to be. Right. Like I, when I call my dad, sometimes, you know, I want my dad and other times I want Dave, Dave, the dad, right? Yeah. That's his name. And it's, it's, I love yeah. talking to Dave, the dad, that man is a yeah. savage, right? Like yeah. he always, he always makes me laugh, but right. at the same time, like he flipped the script and go all dad on me when necessary, you know? Right. And you, you've got to be able to have that, that those times with your children and you, you, hopefully everyone out there has got that relationship with their kids where they feel comfortable asking you things in a situation that they're in and and you can help walk them through and it. if they don't use that as a learning experience the one day when you have kids or if you're in that position you'll do better i you know for for me firsthand when i was growing up and some of the things my dad used to say i used to think my dad has no idea what the hell he's talking about right but as i became a parent my dad knew everything right i mean I, it so for me, it was, he was right the whole time. Um, I, I just wasn't listening. I wasn't ready to listen to it. But until I had children of my own, I realized, you know, some of the ways I probably would have handled it a little bit differently than, than some of the things he did. He was very old school, but, uh, but you ended up at the same place, just a little different route. Same place. Well, I mean, I could talk to you all day. I, I appreciate this conversation. But more importantly, we always end every podcast with this age-old question that if you could go back in time and talk to, let's say, the 22-year-old Peter that's in front of those 50 people, you know, putting yourself on the podium and letting them know, like, this is my stand, what were maybe one, two, or three things you would have told yourself now that could have saved you a ton of time money, headache, heartache. And the best answer is I wouldn't have told myself anything because it made me who I am today. But let's scratch that. Yeah, let's scratch that one. What that, were some that, of the things you would easy. say? I would have said, I would have said your, your discipline, your discipline and accountability is going to serve you well. Um, don't lose that compassion you have for the underdog. Keep climbing. You know, that's a good thing. And, and enjoy your peace and find peace in everything you do. Peter Taunton, everybody. Thanks so much for coming on the show, man. Until next time. Hey, I enjoyed it. Always good to see you, brother. Always good. Yeah. Thank you for listening to another episode. Remember, hope is not a strategy. Keep making moves. Till next time, peace.